Welcome to Food Talk, where we talk about food, fishing, farming, and all things East End. Today is a great show. I've got two of my very good friends, people who I called chef and still call chef, mm -hmm. Gail Arnold and Paul Del Favreau. Paul, the owner of Harbor Market and Kitchen in Sag Harbor. Gail, who is now an educator, but also a private chef for Steven Spielberg. So, Gail, let me just start with you, because you were the chef at Nick and Tony's. So when I first landed at Nick and Tony's behind the bar, you were you were my chef, mm -hmm. and I always refer to you as chef. Yep. But you were so you were one of the first female chefs within that whole genre of female chefs. Because this is now the early '90s. What was that like? And and who who would you consider your influences? Because nowadays it's pretty common to be a, a female chef, if you will. You know. Right. But right. but but tell me about that and what it was like for you. So when I moved out to. East Hampton in, was it 89? I guess it was 88, 89, something like that, to work for Jeff Sally and Tony Ross. Tone, they, we had all worked in the restaurants together in New York. I had gone to California to work for Wolfgang. Jeff said, hey, come back to do this restaurant with us. And I was like, great, sounds fantastic. And uh, yeah, and then I ended up in East Hampton. There were no other women. Well, that's not true. Cheryl was out here, and Laura. I can't remember. Donnelly? I don't know no. if it was Laura Don. She used to be at Coast Grill, Laura somebody. Okay. But you're right. There just weren't many female chefs. And Alice Waters? I mean, did you know her at all? I knew Alice from Jonathan Waxman. Right. So okay. when you're a chef in New York, you do a lot of benefits, and people come together, and women tend to stick together. But quite frankly, my coterie in New York was very male. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, and you probably remember this, Paul, when we were working for Jonathan, he always had women chefs. had female chefs. Always, because so we're he had a lot of women. Awesome. Period in the kitchen, kind of. He had many women in the kitchen. So I mean, Helen Shardek, Stephanie Linus, myself. I mean, Marty, lots of women. We were talking about the, before the show the history between you two guys. So, Paul, where did you meet Gail? And and your relationship predates coming out to East Hampton. I think this is fascinating for our viewers. We all met at at Jonathan's. You know, we we worked all three restaurants that were in the city. This is Jonathan Waxman. Jonathan Waxman. Bud's Hulot's was a little French bistro on Seventy Second and Lex. Lex, and Jams. I had just come back from France, where I knew Stephanie, Mar, uh, Stephanie um, Linus. Linus, Linus, and she was the one who recommended me come work for Jonathan. So I first started working at Jams for a little while. Um, and then I went over to Bud's, and that's where Gail was chef at Bud's. Right. And Bobby Flay was actually working there as well. Right. Gail was in the middle. Sometimes I got caught in the corner, and Bobby <laughs> was on the other side. Um, and we all became friends. And then Jonathan opened up Hulo's, um, which was kind of more my speed because I was a little bit of a Francophile, you know. And uh, we opened up Hulo's. So the little French bistro it was me, Bobby. Um, and Stephanie. Stephanie was the chef, I was a sous chef, and Bobby was one of the line cooks. And then to complete this history, Jeff and Tony's worked, Jeff and Tony worked at Hulo's or at Jams? Jams. 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 Then moved to Bud's. Tony right. Ross, internet who owns Nick and Tony, she was a pastry chef. Correct. Like a little, I'm not sure how many people know that. Oh, and, she's a uh, wonderful pastry she's chef. She's a fabulous pastry chef. <clears throat> and then they moved out here. And Jeff was a captain Jeff at Jeff was at Jams? a captain at Jams, and then he became a manager at Bud's. And then he was at Hulo's, too. Did he move over to Hulo's? I can't they remember. They floated around between the three restaurants. And actually, Jeff and Tony asked me to become the chef at Nick and Tony's, and that's when I got really sick. Right. Um, and couldn't do it. And uh, a year passed, Gail took over, or Gail took the job and moved out there. I think straight from California, no? Yeah, I mean, that's Well, your cooking thing. styles are so different, and yet the, the restaurant continued to have accolades no matter who was cooking, probably because of Jeff's eye for detail, I think. But you, you certainly have French influence coming right from La Varenne, where you were trained. And you had the lighter touch, from, which was more of a, a Waxman influence and a Wolfgang Puck influence, Probably. would you say? I mean, I was still classically French, French trained, trained as yeah. well, but not at La Varenne. I went to like the, I went to a vocational school in Paris. Right. Um, you guys speak a little French right now? Yeah. Um, well, her. Oui, on oh. français. <laughs> um, but can I bring please. back one thing you said about women? I remember when I moved back from France, and I had worked at 
one of the best restaurants in Paris, and I had done this great school. I had this fabulous degree. And I made a list of restaurants that I wanted to work at in New York City. And I just went and pounded on doors. And most of them were French, and I spoke French at that, fluent French at that point. Nobody would hire me. Because you were Nobody working. would hire me. I wanted right. a job as a cook, and they were right. like, they're like, you're great, but no, we're not hiring. I mean, and the French were very clear about why they were not hiring me. It was because I was a woman. It was like, whoa, it was fascinating. And that's when I went to work for pa Patrick Clark down at the Odeon, and I started doing pastries because I, I couldn't find right. a job that's doing right. cooking. Well, you come a long way because now you're yeah. Spielberg's personal chef. You have cooked for luminaries, um, uh, heads of state, uh, top, top Hollywood um, uh, people. celebrities, yeah. people. Um, and t have there been any unusual requests, or are they just mostly just normal people in terms of uh, when, well, you, when you cook for them? I think, and Paul would agree, you know, being able to work out here, I work privately, obviously Paul's in, in you know, has his, has his place. Uh, People, first of all, when you come to Steven Spielberg's house, you're coming to Steven Spielberg's house. So you're on your best behavior, I would right. like to, I'd, I'd, I'd hope. And then we have a beautiful garden, like you talk about. You know, I try to get the best produce, and everything is as much as possible as local. I make my own jams. I make mm. my own ketchup. I do all that kind of crazy stuff that I just love to do. So everybody comes. It's gorgeous out here. You're in good company. So honestly, no. You never, you've never even I've told never, me. I've nightmare. never had a nightmare. Maybe a gluten-free person here or there, but that's. Yeah, but even that, that's they're pretty, you know, simple. We all, it's simple. And we also have a multitude, you know, a variety of things that people can choose from. So if you're gluten-free, you just choose not to have the pizza that night or something like what, that. What, what are some of your favorite um, local markets or farm stands um, out here, some of your go-tos? Well, I go to the farmer's market every Friday at Nick and Tony's because oh. I can get a lot of different things. But because we're in East Hampton, uh, Balsam Farm is definitely a go-to. Right. And I like shopping at Round Swamp uh, because I loved the women there. There's a farm. They raise chickens out on the North Fork, Bowders, Browders, Browders Birds. Yeah. I always say, have you tasted their chicken? I have not. OMG. Delicious chicken. It's just. And again, a, a chicken that that's runs around in a pasture. I grew up in South Jersey, and I remember when I took a bite, it just tasted like I was growing up. It tasted like the farm down the road where we would go and mm. you know, pick out the chicken that mm. we were going to then have for dinner that night. So that's one of my, you know, that's, that's a good place. Um, what about you, Paul? Any uh, particular? North Fork, I love. There's a one called Eight Hands Farm. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Where I used to get my eggs from. Um, and they do, they raise chickens, pasture raised chickens as well, and terrific, you know, they do lamb, uh, great little farm. Um, I love Balsam Farms as well. Um, I also like the farmer's market at Nick and Tony's. Right. Yeah. Um, and I love Round Swamp Farm just because of that room in the back, you know. It's so, so well organized, so beautiful to walk in there. Everything looks pristine. By the way, folks, this is the man who gave Uma Thurman a ride home. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't even know who she was. Um, oh, he knew who she nah, was. I had a feeling who she was, yeah. But you were, like, beat up that night. As that I was recall. David Lohenberg when he was uh, doing the front door at Nick and Tony's. No you know, kidding. I was in the kitchen. So tell us that house. story. That's such a great story. It was the end of the night. <laughs> right. You know, and there Saturday was night. me and somebody else in the kitchen. Right. I had an old beat up Volkswagen. Right. The floorboards were rusting out. You know, you could see the ground as you're driving. And uh, David comes in the back of the kitchen. He says, do you want to drive some, one of our customers home? You know, they can't get a cab and they really want to get home. And I was like, OK, you know, I sure. And he goes, oh, by the way, it's Uma Thurman. And I was like, <gasps> I ran outside to the parking lot and cleaned up my car because there was dirty chef clothes and pants and everything in there. And I drove around the front and I sat there and waited. And sure enough, here she came with one of her girlfriends. Oh, and, man. Uh, what a story. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And then I believe it was in the paper, like, the next day. Oh, it was. Uh, yeah. How unusual. <laughs> now, now um, the other thing that a lot of people don't know are some of the legendary poker games that we played. Some of them oh. at Nick and Tony's. They were unbelievable. Do you remember the time <clears throat> when... I think it was um, Tom Fahey invited a guy from Sag Harbor who ended up being a ringer. He, clean, he cleaned, cleaned us out. out. AC Ducey. AC, <laughs> AC Ducey. 
We also had an AC DC game at your house up on Sycamore uh -huh. that was legendary because um, we were screaming. This is in February. We were screaming at the top of our lungs. I know that Peter Myers was there. Tom Fahey was there. Jeff um, Salloway. Jeff Salloway was there. I think Joey was there. Yeah. You and, um, oh, we were screaming at the top of our lungs. I'm surprised that the cops didn't come because it was times. big. Really little small times. pots that yeah. grew to be $70, which was a big deal was for us. a big us. deal back then. We had yeah. a lot of fun. Um, so... Um, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes ask, five people that you would invite to dinner, from, from the, the whole history of the world, um, Gail, you're up. Who would you, who would you invite? Okay, I've thought about this because it's not an easy. I would like to have multiple dinner parties, to be honest, <laughs> different crowds. But I have to say, my maternal grandmother, because I would love to just pick her brain about pies again, because she made a fabulous pie. My, no, my paternal grandmother, my maternal great-grandmother, who ran a bar and uh, was a wonderful cook, I'm told. My husband's brother, Alex, who died before I got to meet him, and he just supposedly was a hoot, and I just would love to meet him. And then, of course, I'd have to have my husband, because I'd like to see him with his brother again. Like, mm, it would be sweet. That's sweet. And then Edna Lewis, who is a cookbook writer, she's recently Past, I mean, several years ago Soul now. Food. Uh, Southern, Southern cooking, uh -huh. and she's a goddess to me. I had the pleasure of cooking with her once at one of the James Beard Awards, and there was just a dignity and grace about her. And I, yeah, so, I think so some family, yeah. some uh, some some cooks, yeah. and some well, family. family. And then there's this other person. This I, when I worked at this restaurant in Paris called La Castrat, it was named after a fourth century BC poet who was a gastronome who wrote about food. And apparently he, what remains of his writing are only fragments of all these verses of his poetry, but they all talk about food and conviviality. And so I thought it'd be kind of cool to have him there, but that's six. Yeah, that's pretty much cheating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Deli, what about yourself? Uh, um, I, I think number one would be my, my wife's mother, who I never got to meet and who's a lot of food, whose food I cook a lot of, you know, the old recipes that Susanna has. Um, my dad's uncle, who was in the business, you know, the restaurant business, and used to cook privately for Zero Mostel and worked in a couple of restaurants in New York oh. City, um, who I was told was a terrific chef. Um, my father's mother, who I never got to meet. Um, she passed before I was born, but also one of those great Italian, like, home cooks with the homemade pasta and everything out on the bed, you know, drying uh. and stuff like that, and the big meals on Sunday. Um, Marcella Hazan, I think, who passed not too long ago, yeah, but right. love her books and love her food. And she actually came into Nick and Tony's yes. when I was the chef there, um, which was a big highlight for me. Uh, that's, what, one, two, three, four. And I don't know. I think Barack Obama, actually. <laughs> I cooked for him in Las Vegas, you know, but I would love to sit down one-on-one -on -one and, and have dinner with he him. He seems like a perfectly normal guy. Yeah. You know, His but wife is delightful, oh, yeah. you know. Oh, how um, sweet. Good. But yeah, I think those are good five people. Um, a little uh, Cafe Bustello. I'd love to. It's been a Red Bull day for me, which I, I hate to admit, but, um, you know, it is in the summer out here. Um, so... Um, we're going to play a Thank little, I'm, just, I'm not doing a good job of no, playing, I'm right. sorry guys. We're used to, you know. I used to be a bartender. I know. Um, <laughs> allegedly good, but I'm not so sure about that now. Um, so, we play a little game here called, uh, Great. I love games. <laughs> food definition roulette. Okay. Now, if you guys know, just, just be quiet. what is slum gullion? Did I stump the chefs? Slum Gullion. Food Lover's Companion, folks. Slum Gullion. No yeah. clue. When I tell you, you're gonna you're gonna get it. Okay. I don't know. Oh, like we stumped the chefs. That's wrong. <laughs> it is it is wrong because I love you guys so much. But slum gullion is a slang term originated during the California gold rush and describes dishes, usually stews made from leftovers. Interesting. So you'll be serving slum gullion at Spielies, and you'll probably have it on the menu at, at Harbor Market. Slum gullion. Slum yeah. gullion. Yeah. I mean, it, it just sounds like a fun name. 
but actually, if you keep going into the definition, it, it, this so it's really a type of food that they make. Yeah, well, it's really just a stew made of leftovers, and then and then they they actually talk about that it's it's really kind of disgusting in its roots, but. <laughs> I think it's well. You know, I teach kids, and uh, I always think of funny words that they would have no idea what they are, but that are good vocab not necessarily good vocabulary words, but often good vocabulary words, but they have multiple syllables. No, thanks. So slumgullion would there be great. Go. As you were saying that, I was trying to do the etymology. Is it Greek? Is it Latin? It's not. I knew it was Anglo-Saxon, but didn't help from, me get the answer, From the Stevie. minors. Uh, Paulie, if we went to Harbor Market, mm. what what's... What's cooking good over there right now? What's, what, 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 would, what would be the, the right thing to get if you walked in? Tell um, us a little bit about your Some menu. of the most popular things are the tortilla mm. that we're going to try today. Uh, we do a chicken kebab marinated in yogurt and cumin and olive oh. oil, lemon juice. That's really popular. Uh, we do a lamb kebab, or it's called a shashkalik or shashlik. shashlik. Should have been one of my words. I think it's yeah. Persian, actually. So it's kind of like a kefta. You know, it's ground lamb molded onto a stick. And we serve it with pistachios um, and tahini sauce. That um, sounds scrumptious. I do the famous carrot salad that I learned from Gail Arnold years and years ago with, you know, Moroccan carrot salad with cumin oh. and lemon juice and garlic. Um, I love a lot of that North African flavors and stuff. But we try and keep things healthy, healthy and plant-based. You know, so there's a big selection of, of salads to pick from. Um, and then we have the, you know, prepare to order menu where we do lobster roll and chicken fingers and falafel and things like that. So it's fun food, you know. Mm -hmm. We try and keep it light and uh, not too serious. And uh, I try and use as much local as I can get in there, you know. We just started buying from Balsam Farm shishito peppers and heirloom tomatoes and corn and things like that. Mm. So. Your corn is no. awesome right now. Yeah. So you're cooking. You're the featured chef on September 10th oh, yeah, with Colin. At, with Colin um, for the Slow Food uh, uh -huh. East End Gala. Do you know what you're cooking yet? We're making a little tart, like a crustata of local peaches and blackberries. Oh, yum. With, uh, mm. you know, local ice cream. Ah, oh, that sounds delicious. Yum. I wish yeah. I were here. That would be fun. September 10th? September 10th. Nice. Yeah, yeah. over at Colin's place. Um, Gail, why don't you and I switch seats and... Um, you're going to do a little slicing and dicing of Paul's. Uh, Excellent. So this isn't. Uh, we think of a tortilla as something Mexican, but this, Paulie, what do you call this again? This is called a tortilla española. Española. And it's basically like a frittata. You know, it's potatoes and onions cooked. Your wife is going to kill you. I know. My, <laughs> she, you were not supposed to say frittata. <laughs> cooked in lots of extra virgin olive oil because mm. the Spaniards love their olive oil. Mm. Um, and you cook those down until they're done, and then you cool them down. And then you mix it with eggs, and you put it into a frying pan um, to get that shape, you know. And you finish baking it in the oven, and it comes I out switch. solid like, uh, you know, like I, a cake. I just have to say, just having you two guys here, you two are probably just some of my favorite chefs I've ever worked with oh, because God. of just your dedication to the craft. But man, that food taste is good. I was just thinking about, Polly, what's that classic French dish? I'm drawing, I'm drawing a blank on it. That you cooked out of the oven, that is a winter dish that has lamb, um, sausage. Uh, cassoulet. Okay. Cassoulet, oh my god in heaven. That is a sick dish. That is, so, that is just so classic. And then also the lobster with the corn. corn I mean, you yeah. used, to, used to sell like 50 of those a night. It was insane. And the langoustine we used to do too. Oh, yeah. The down the middle oh, with goodness. the garlic and parsley. And, and you had that, that simple white bean salad that you couldn't take off the menu. With also the, the calamari with the yeah. ponzu yeah. sauce. I yeah. mean, people, st I still miss it. And this is probably 15, 20 years ago, you know? Gail did a dish a long time ago that you never did again. You called it Mongolian beef. And you put it in a little radicchio cup. And Jeff and I were sitting out at the bar. You were in one of your moods, and you were just kind of <laughs> making stuff. And you sent it out to me, and I never forgot it to this day. It's well over 20 years ago. Wow. It was something that you picked up with Wolfgang. Yeah, you know, probably. Oh, that's right. It's chinois. It would have been yeah. something uh -huh. of that. And what was, so what was in it? it? You know, it was like thinly sliced beef, and it had some spice to it. It was just something I never forgot. I never forgot. That's that sweet. That's when you really get those, sweet. And that's yeah. how I am about... Um, What's the French dish again? I'm drawing up. Cassoulet. Yeah, thank you. That's how I'm about your cassoulet. Every single cassoulet I've ever had always is compared to that one. Oh. I swear. No, it's true, brother. And um, 
You know, Gail, you know how to so, so, yes, let's get I mean, I, I don't want to interrupt this Paulis. conversation. It's called the Torta de España, not the <laughs> F word. Tortilla we didn't swear. Es tortilla Española. Tor tortilla. Tortilla, tortilla. Española. Es es My wife is from Spain, so this right. is actually her mom's recipe. Yum. Okay, I'm just saying that if you're watching or listening to this, you cannot smell the tortilla. I mean, you got you what can does it smell. smell like? Well, you've got the you can smell the potatoes. You just know from smelling it that they've been cooked in olive oh, oil. Mm. It is one of those. It's just I can tell that it's going to be luscious and rich tasting. So I'm very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, it's an example of the passion. Okay. All right. The other thing that um, I just have to, well, say I'm going to cut another piece. They're very rich. So the Spanish would have this with. It, a little it's mixed a, green salad. Mixed, or a or snack, just a right? Snack. If you're hungry yeah, after school, you have itself. one yeah. at home. No. So you notice that there's, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to make a mess of this, but um, you can just see, Stevie, how, incorpor how beautifully incorporated the, uh, the potato is with the egg. And, and again, it's a really, what I love about it is it's really simple. It's really simple. It's not the most gorgeous of dishes, no. you know, but it's good. And it's great because it can be all local. Potatoes mm -hmm. are available, onions are available, sure. eggs are available, exactly. so it's all local, um, and that's a big plus. Okay, I'm making a mess. But this is something that we eat at home all the time. The kids love it. Susanna always puts it between two pieces of bread and makes a sandwich out oh, of it. Oh, yum. Yeah, that's you know? perfect. Um, but it's really a great, a great thing to have in the fridge. And we sell a ton of it at the, at the market. Oh, that's great. Well, okay, I'm licking my I think, finger already. I think we can. Do we switch back or I stay here? You can stay. Okay, beautiful. Oh, do you want a fork? I have a fork. I'm so rude. Oh, wow. Well, it just goes We're to doing really where poor. Where I come from. We're doing poor on service today. Uh, <laughs> go back of the house today. I should know better, but no, oh, that's delicious. I always drizzle a little more olive oil and do a lot of salt Sorry. and pepper, but that's is, me. Is this normally served hot? It can be hot or cold, but, but we always good eat it cold. cold. Yeah. Because you can have this breakfast. I can see it's just a, just, it's a real just simple, kilometer. simple thing, yeah. Late at night? It's gorgeous. Wow. We sell a lot of them at the market, a lot. Yeah. And people seem to know it, too. Like, they call it by name, and it's not so foreign to them. So right. that was always a good thing. Right. But I think that, to me, like, the trick is really cooking those potatoes in oil. Because I've tried to do it lower fat, if you will. Mm. And it's good. But this is sublime. Not the same. Yeah. yeah this is sublime. Paul, if you weren't you, who would you be? That's a really tough question. Uh, I'm drinking yours. You mean what would Switch. I be as my profession, or just who would I be who would as you be? a? By the way, I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe Derek Jeter for me, but I don't, you know. I don't know if I'd really want to be anybody famous. I think I just would like to be a kind of a traveler, mm. someone who gets to see, you know, the world and moves around a lot. Well, that's a good I answer. Think that would be I nice. Like that. What about you, Gail? <sighs> Yeah, I, I, like Paul, I, I'm happy being me. Yeah. I'm just really happy being me. It's fun. I have a, you know, I'm Do lucky. either of you have a, somebody that you would consider um, the most influential person in your life, or a couple of them? Culinary or just in general? In general. Time's well, up. <laughs> in general, no, in general, I would say my, uh, the, the, I'm a Quaker, and so I think that the Quaker Friends that I had growing up were, are huge, continue to be a big influence on me. Uh, so just in the way I, you know, even like Quakers believe in simplicity. So when I cook food, it's simple. There's mm. a lot of things that I think come into my life that are based on Quakerism. Uh, Food-wise, I'd have to say my dad because he loved to cook. I mean, he cooked at a time when, you know, he got Gourmet Magazine. You know, we dried corn in the dryer. We kept eel in the, in the bathtub. I mean, he was a crazy wow. good cook. So I think that he well, gave me confidence right. to try try things. So, yeah. Do you use Quaker oats? No, um, no, I don't. <laughs> just, <laughs> I, just, uh, I just wondered, you know. <laughs> uh, Paul, what's your favorite thing about living on the East End? Um, the water, the ocean. Yeah. I mean, I lived in Vegas for 10 years. Oh, yeah. Um, God, how know, was that? That was fun. It was fun. But I had had enough. You know, it was time to come oh, home. Yeah. Um, and I've always considered this place home. I want my kids to grow up here. 
but I love the, the change of seasons. I love the agricultural part of this, you know, yeah. east end of Long Island. Um, and I really miss the ocean. Yeah. Even though I don't get to see it that much. Know. Just knowing that it's there. Just knowing that it's and there makes it a big difference for me. Yeah, right, right, right. I agree. Yeah. I was talking to our mutual friend and former co-worker, Judith Jordan, on Monday night. And she just came out with a statement. You know, um, we live by the beach. And, uh, you know, you just some, sometimes you forget that when you're grinding it out in the summer, but it is, it is glorious. What about yourself? I mean, I know that you're not a full-time resident here, but. It's, I, I mean, I know everybody says this, but the light is just mm. spectacular out here. And also the smell. I have to tell you that, again, I'm lucky I, I, worked, I do work near the ocean. And there are some days, depending on how the wind is blowing, there's just you smell the ocean, and there's nothing like smelling. It's true. No, you. I know it. I know it. But the yeah. light is spectacular. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're lucky enough to live by the water, you're lucky enough, right? That's what they that's say. That's right. <laughs> it's true. I've been in the water almost every day. I tried to do it before work. I didn't do it today because uh -huh. rushing over here, sleepy. That's why sometimes when I'm sleepy, that little dip in the ocean is better than the Red Bull that I drank this morning yeah. or even this yeah. delicious Cafe Bustelo. Yeah. Yeah, nice coffee, producer. by the way. Well, that's, that's the producer. Ellen, Ellen J. Watts. The other thing I want to mention quickly <laughs> is the mint that's on your set. The mint is insane. Beautiful. I'm assuming that's a, obviously it looks, everything I know here is local, so that mint is gorgeous. So you Tiny took mint. this and you put it between your fingers and I could smell it over there. Yeah. Oh, I can smell it wow. right here. Right oh, now. that's yeah. wild. That is really Pretty. rich. Yeah, I'm not used to it having such a small leaf, so I don't know that variety. Yeah, I got fooled by what it was, but it's just. I did too. I thought it was oregano. It looked a little bit like oregano. Mm. Well, I really want to thank you guys for coming on the show. You're two of my favorite people, two of my favorite chefs. I have such fond memories of working for you. I, I do still too. want to call you guys chef. You, you know, can. Because you can. <laughs> but it's, and let's just talk about that because that's, this, is, this is the people, when we call you chef, it's a, it's a, it's a term of respect. Mm -hmm. Do you guys call you chef in the kitchen? They do. Good. They do. And when I worked in Vegas, it was a big thing, you know. Of course, it was. You had a lot of chefs in that sure. place. Oh so yeah, that was a big time. You know, you got a lot of lot of respect there. Yeah. That's so that was easy. That's all we have time for today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say to our viewers, coge lo suave, pero cogelo. Take it easy, but take it. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>